Well, good morning. I'm so glad that all of you are here this morning. Maybe it'll help if I turn my mic on. How about that? You can hear me now, can't you? Yeah. I was telling them they've got these monitors here, and so the scary thing is now I can hear myself. Have you ever heard yourself on videotape? It's kind of the same thing, but live now. And anyways, we're starting a new series today over the Ten Commandments, and I'm really excited to do this series with you. In fact, Margaret ordered these little bookmarks. We did bookmarks during our bookmark series, so Margaret said, in case you forget what the Ten Commandments are, we'd better order y'all some, and you can just keep it in your Bible or keep it around in your bulletin so y'all can just read directly what it is. Betty's looking at me like I'm crazy because who could forget the Ten Commandments, right? Well, take them one of these then, Betty. Take them. We have a lot more as well. So we're starting this new series, and I'm really excited about it. So let's start off by reading Exodus chapter 20, verses 1 through 3. Exodus chapter 20, verses 1 through 3. Now, although we're going to have it up here on the screens, I do want to make this note. Don't let the screens be a reason not to bring your Bible as well to church. Sometimes what I've discovered is when we have it up on the screens too that people stop bringing their Bibles, but then you start to kind of lose place of where these isolated texts fit into this whole thing. And this whole thing is one big story and one big unit. So, so do both. Do both. And if you do happen to forget your Bible one day, well, that's okay. We've got it on the screens as well. So Exodus chapter 20 verses 1 through 3. And God spoke all these words. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt out of the land of slavery you shall have no other gods before me commandment number one well it's no secret to most of the teenagers in the youth department or the kids in our children's ministry but I'm a really big Harry Potter fan I love it. I love the books and I love the movies. I think they're awesome and I'm way past the age where I should be so obsessed with Harry Potter like I am, but I love it. And all, out of all of J.K. Rowling's books, that's the author, out of all of her books, my personal favorite has to be the book Harry Potter and the Goblet of Fire. In this particular chapter of the boy wizard's life, he finds himself competing in a deadly tournament confronted by angry dragons and vengeful mermaids and all kinds of dark magic. <laughs> but Harry soon discovers that, that the most difficult part of this tournament isn't the dragons and it isn't the mermaids. The most difficult part of it is a maze. It's a maze that he has to enter within. In the story, the, the dangers that are lurking within the hedges of this maze, they, they're not really the problem. There's a lot of dangerous things within the maze, but that, that's not really the problem. You see, it's the maze itself that's the problem. In the movie, the headmaster wizard Dumbledore warns the young wizards about the risk involved upon entering into this maze. He cautions them. You see, he says, people change in the maze. Oh, find the cup if you can, but be very wary. You could just lose yourselves along the way. A simple analogy, I realize, but nevertheless, life can really feel that way. Can it not? <clears throat> life can sometimes feel like this giant, crazy maze. And the more complicated that this maze becomes as it unfolds, the more twists and turns that you discover, the more obstacles that suddenly, almost magically, manifest out of the dark corners, the easier it is to suddenly lose yourself along the way. We are, well, after all, forgetful people. 
In the wizard's narrative, Harry and his friends soon turn on each other, seemingly forgetting why they were here in the first place. You know, it's the same problem. It's the same problem that the people of Isaiah's day had too. The prophet Isaiah in chapter 40, the prophet, almost bewildered, has to ask the Israelite people, have you not known? Like, come on, what's the deal here, fellas? Have you not heard? And then in chapter 43, verses 10 through 13, God speaking to his own people says this to them. He says, you are my witnesses, declares the Lord. And my servant whom I have chosen so that you may know and believe me and understand that I am he before me. No God was formed, nor will there be one after me. I, even I, am the Lord, and apart from me there is no Savior I have revealed and saved and proclaim I. And not some foreign God among you. You are my witnesses, declares the Lord, that I am God. That's a great verse. If you ever feel lost in your Christian life and you don't know what it is exactly you're supposed to be doing or who you're supposed to be, Isaiah chapter 43, verse 12. You are my witnesses, declares the Lord, that I am God. And then he finishes in verse 13. Yes, and from ancient days... I am he. No one can deliver out of my hand when I act. Who can reverse it? <laughs> That's what God has to tell his people. He seems a little bewildered. Have you not known? Like, have you not heard? Don't you remember all these things that I've done for you? But they had forgotten. The Israelite people, they had lost their way. You know, it had been nearly 700 years since God had given Moses these 10 commandments. 700 years, life had gotten a little complicated, <laughs> to say the least. Over the course of those 700 years, they had fought their way inch by inch, town by town, into the promised land. They had established a kingdom under Saul, seen their pinnacle under David, built a temple under Solomon split into two subsequent kingdoms, Israel and Judah, watched as idolatry and syncretism plagued the hearts of their leaders. All the while, they had been fighting. Like all of this time, they had been fighting off rather unsuccessfully the other powerful nations of the day, including the Assyrian and the Babylonian empires, which finally do them in. They finally take care of that pesky Israel. And in the course of this tricky maze to find security as God's people, they forgot. They forgot who they were supposed to be and who God was supposed to be for them. They had lost themselves. That's the thing about these Ten Commandments, especially this, well, especially the first one on the list, you shall have no other gods before me. That's a forgettable commandment. It's so easily forgotten because it's so obvious to us. We don't live in a polytheistic Culture. Most of the people I know aren't trying to proselytize some other God to me. Why can't the first one, you know, why can't the first one on the list be something that I really struggle with like every day? Why can't the first one be something about gossip or lying? In a sermon elsewhere, Pastor Erwin McManus says that God has actually set the bar pretty low here. <laughs> like this is a low Bar. In fact, it's so low that the text doesn't even claim that other gods don't exist. It doesn't even say that. It just says don't put any of them above Yahweh. But I think that the forgettability of the first commandment is what makes it so dangerous. The forgettability of it. It's so easy to forget that many of us 
in the midst of a hectic, busy, maze-like life, do forget it. And, and then along the way, we find ourselves just as lost as Harry Potter's wizarding friends, and just as lost as a sixth century Israelite. Now, I said we don't live in a polytheistic culture, but the truth is we do. We sure do. We may not live in a polytheistic culture like the Israelites lived in, but there are other gods out there, little g gods, that are vying for our attention just isn't as obvious to us. We don't have the prophets of Baal, megaphone in hand, standing on street corners, preaching some different theology or some different religion. But you know what we do have? We do have the prophets of materialism, barking at us, nipping at our heels every time we turn on the television or, or open a magazine. You can't be happy without this. We do have the prophets of money beckoning us to buy into their eschatological message. He who dies with the most toys wins. We do have the prophets of power whispering in our ear like grimma worm tongue whenever someone dares to try to correct. Or reprove us. Don't you take that lying down. We do have the prophets of busyness. Shoving their pamphlets into our hands. Here, here's what's really important. Focus on this. Yes, there are other prophets. Who will do anything to get you to replace your God with theirs. Scary to think about, isn't it? And yet, and yet somewhere in the midst of this life, somewhere in the midst of this alternative, prophetic, message-filled maze, God's word still reigns. You shall have no other gods before me. You know what I think? I think that the real message of the first commandment to us is this. If we do not keep God before us, something else will quickly contend to take his place. If we do not keep God before us. But there's a problem with that, though. There's a big problem with that. You know what the problem is? You are in a maze. All of you, me, we are all in the maze. And, and you know what? We can't just escape the maze. You can't do it. You can't just get a chainsaw and shred your way out of this maze because you have commitments. You have other things going on in your life. You have businesses to run. You have people counting on you. You have schedules to keep. You have activities and holidays to move your family to and from. A lot of you still have homes that you're still working on. You are in a maze and you can't just escape it. You can't just escape the maze. Furthermore, there are going to be times when you will find yourself lured down a dark corridor into darkness by one of these other false gods. And what they're promising is terribly tempting. Like what one of these other prophets is offering, it's very attractive. And we are, after all, forgetful people. <laughs> so you're going to have to do some things to help remind you. That's what you're going to have to do in this life. You're going to have to do some things to help you remember that what these other gods and these other prophets are offering you doesn't really exist. You are going to have to do some things that help keep God before you. 
So first, first, if you want to keep God before you, here's the first thing that you're going to have to do. If you want to keep God before you, you're going to have to make church a priority. You're going to have to make church a priority. As any good American will tell you, one of the best things about the fall in the United States is football. <laughs> right? Do we have any football fans in here? Okay, just a few. Yeah. Especially college football. College football is fun to watch. Have you all ever seen that show on ESPN? It's called College Game Day on ESPN. It's a really cool show. There's a lot of clever features of the show. One of the cool things about it is it's live. So like whatever the, whatever the college kids are doing in the background, it's all the commentators sitting up here and just, I mean, throngs of college students. So whatever they do, it's seen on TV. <laughs> Lee Corso, one of the, the commentators on it, usually does something wacky or says something funny and he puts on an outfit or he puts on a mascot head. Whoever he predicts to wins the game, he puts on this big head and it's, it's a fun show. But you know what one of the best parts of, of the show is? is all the signs that the college kids are holding up in the background. They're all holding up these signs that they want seen on TV. And, and these signs span, <laughs> they span the best and the worst of college adolescent humor. And, and I've seen some really good ones. Here's some of the best that I've, that I've ever seen, some of these good signs. One of them said, if I had a dollar for every time UT said, this is our year. <laughs> This is a good one. You'll really like this one. It says, Hillary deleted my other sign. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. and a personal favorite of mine, being a Baylor grad, it must have been from a Baylor fan, they held a sign that said, even Gandhi hated TCU. <laughs> I'm with them there. <laughs> if only all the artists were so pure, but occasionally some people use these signs uh, to kind of push their own agenda or their own viewpoints on something. So uh, about a year ago, I was watching, and somebody was holding this bright yellow sign. You couldn't miss it. It was a bright yellow sign, and it said, You need Jesus. Good so far, right? You need Jesus. But then right underneath that, they had, Churches are a joke. You need Jesus. Churches are a joke. Now I wonder, it made me wonder what would lead a person to have such a negative view of the church. Perhaps they had a bad church experience and, and it disillusioned the sign writer. But, it, but if you're disillusioned by church, it only means that you're holding on to some illusion of the church that you might not to hold on to in the first place. <laughs> Make no mistake, I'm no magician, so you won't be seeing any illusions this morning <laughs> or ever in our church. And although held up by one person, the sign represents the feelings of many. My own grandfather, as a matter of fact. I, have a, I had a grandfather who believed that he didn't need church at all, that all he needed was his personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Like, that's all he needed. And as long as he could maintain that, to him, there was no need to go to church. But, but I ask you, is that really all a person needs is it even possible is it even possible to maintain your own relationship with jesus all by yourself now I admit it a personal re relationship with jesus christ is foundational for every christian you have to have a personal relationship with jesus christ but we are after all forgetful people we need a little help sometimes. And the truth about church is this, that there's no other institution. There's no other group of people. There's nothing else on earth that is created to help you remember God. There's nothing else in the world that's trying to help you do that. In fact, one could look at what we do here in corporate worship, what we do here all together on Sunday mornings as just one giant reminder Sunday is the giant reminder for you that God is God. When we meet, the focus is all on God. Where else do you go during the week that proclaims the same thing? Where else do you go? Will, will the jobs that you go to at 9 a.m. tomorrow morning begin the day with prayer and silence or meditation or scripture reading? Will the schools 
that you drop your kids or your grandkids off at, will they teach the kids and remind them to love the Lord with all their heart? Will the businesses or the stores that you go shopping at have a communion table at the entrance so you can take the Lord's Supper? <laughs> the questions are ridiculous because the answer is obviously no. Nowhere else you go this week will make it their priority to remind you that God is Lord of all. So if you're going to keep God before you, you just have to make the one place designated and dedicated to that message a priority in your life. But you know what I've discovered about church? <laughs> what I've come to discover sometimes is that showing up isn't enough. <laughs> so if you're going to keep God before you, you are also going to have to expend yourself into this church. I don't mean this actual church, but whatever church you go to, this church church even the prophets recognized that attendance and even participation in religious activity wasn't nearly enough to keep God before the people the Israelites the Israelites were some of the best people at church ever in the history of the world and listen to what God says to them in Amos chapter 5 verses 21 through 23 God says to his own people I hate I despise your festivals I take no delight in your solemn assemblies, even though you offer me your burnt offerings and grain offerings, I will not accept them. Hmm. And the offerings of well-being of your fatted animals, I will not look upon. Take away from me the noise of your songs, God says. I will not listen to the melody of your harps. The Israelite people who were deeply religious, who were the best at church. Even they knew that showing up wasn't enough. Then they were in the temple every Saturday. They were there. They gave their tithes. They gave their offerings faithfully. They led Bible studies. They sang in the choir. They did it all. And yet, in the midst of all that religion, all that church going, they still placed other gods before God. What were they missing? In Eugene Peterson's book, Under the Unpredictable Plant, the author writes about the importance of geography. And by geography, he means this place at this time. That's what he means by geography. He writes in there, pastoral work is geographical as much as it is theological. Pastors, he says, pastors don't send memos, don't send generic messages, don't work from a distance. Locale is part of it. It is the nature of pastoral work to be on site, working things out in the particular soil of a particular parish. Now, although I understand Eugene Peterson is speaking about and to pastors, his message rings true for all Christians. You know, here's another prophet you're going to face. You're going to face a prophet of consumerism. And he's going to invite you to hop from church to church. Or from place to place, depending on what's new or what's popular or what the music sounds like or how the pastor is preaching. But you are called to plant yourself somewhere. To expend yourself somewhere in the particular soil of a particular church. I mean, that's why we're all here at Trinity, isn't it? That's why you're here. You could be at a lot of places this morning. You could, and there are a lot of good churches in Orange. There's a lot of good churches, but you are here at this place, at this time, and, and showing up just isn't enough. And even if this isn't the place for you, and that's okay, it won't hurt my feelings. Even if this isn't the place for you, if you really want to keep God before you, you are going to have to invest yourself into a community, a faith where you can know and be known by other people. So join a church. 
even if it's not this one, join a church. Get involved in one of our Sunday morning small groups. Get involved in one of our Bible studies. That's where you're really going to get to know people. Take someone out for coffee or take them out for one of those delicious crepes over at Lucy's. They're only open during breakfast and lunch. Invite a family over for dinner, somebody you don't know. If you're going to keep God before you, you're going to have to expend yourself into this church. You're going to have to dig your hands like a farmer does. You're going to have to dig your hands deep into the ground and sprout roots because showing up just isn't enough to keep God before you. And lastly, lastly, if you want to keep God before you, you are going to have to do some things during the week that help Sunday last just a little bit longer. You're going to have to do some things during the week that'll help the experience on Sunday last just a little bit longer. I'm a pastor and, and my life is consumed with God. Like that's all I do. I write sermons and I, and I read scripture and I read books about theology. And when I come and I meet with you or have coffee with you, what we talk about a lot of the time is God. And when I call my friends up, we talk about church and how to do church better and God and theology and all these different things. This past weekend, I was at a Chandler family reunion and my brother was there. He's also a pastor. And he and I started talking about theology. And then all of a sudden he stopped and he looked at me and he said, nobody else at this table finds this interesting except you and I. But that's our life. That's what we're going to And my wife said, thank you. And uh, we stopped talking about it. But like, that's our life. But you know what? My life, even though it's consumed with it, even with that, the worship and experience of Sunday sometimes lasts so little into my week. Like on Sunday, I'm like, oh yeah, this is what I'm supposed to be doing. And then sometimes, depending on what's happening on Monday, the dreadful Monday, I could forget all of that. I, even I, with this lifestyle, I will find myself forgetting the very first commandment. The maze will finally catch up to me. And even though I preached it, I won't remember what the sermon was about. And I will bow down before some other God. It inevitably happens even to a person like me whose life is consumed with it. And so you know what that tells me? It says that if I want to keep God before me, I'm going to have to do some things between the Sundays to help me. And by the way, I want to put in a quick plug right here. I've talked with some of our leadership about it, and we'd like to start a Wednesday night program. Not for us. Not because we want to have one more program that you have to show up to. We want to start a Wednesday night program for you. Because we know that this is important. And we know that you'll forget between the Sundays. And so spiritually for me, and I know it's true for you as well, I need something on Wednesday night that helps me go, oh, yeah. <laughs> Oh, yeah, I remember. I remember God, and I remember who I'm supposed to be. So I hope when we start it up, I don't know when we're going to start it up, and I don't know how it's going to look right now, but we're going to start one. I hope that you'll come to it, not for me, but for you. It'll be important for you. But here's some other things that I have to do between the Sundays. You know what I have to do? I have to pray, and I have to spend time in God's Word. That's foundational right there. Prayer and God's Word, and you're going to have to do it too. There's a book by Bill Hybels that's called Too Busy Not to Pray. <laughs> that's a good title, right? Too Busy Not to Pray. I've never read the book before. <laughs> I've never read it. But that doesn't mean that I didn't get anything out of it. The title alone speaks volumes to me. You see, the maze is too crazy. It's just too unpredictable for you not to spend time in prayer. So if you're going to keep God before you, you're going to have to learn to develop a healthy prayer life. Well then, pastor, how then should I pray? Well, there's a lot of good ways to pray, but you know what I found is one of the best ways to pray? One of the best ways to pray is by praying the Psalms. Just opening up to chapter one of Psalms, and while you're reading it, you're saying it as a prayer. As well, That's one of the best ways to do it. Have any of you ever done that before? It's amazing. The Psalms, the Psalms just run the gamut of all human emotion. Like while you're reading the Psalms, you kind of get the feeling that whoever wrote it 
David for part of it, but whoever the others are, that they live one heck of a crazy maze-like life. And the writer just takes all their emotion. And they just they take all their mess and their emotion and they didn't put it before the feet of God, just right there in front of him and say, deal with that. And I kind of like that. The singer Isaac Beshevis, quoted by William Barrett in The Illusion of Technique, once said, Whenever I am in trouble, I pray. And since I'm always in trouble, I pray a lot. <laughs> That's true for me. I bet it's true for you, too. <clears throat> Learning to pray in the school of the Psalms, it's just a healthy thing for us to do. Again, Eugene Peterson is helpful. He tells us why. Peterson says that honesty is essential in prayer. So that we're honest with God in prayer, that's essential. And then he says, but we are after more than that, more than honesty. We are after as much of life as possible, all of life, if possible, brought to expression in answering God, which is what prayer is. Prayer is answering and talking with God. And then he says that means learning a form of prayer that is adequate to the complexity of our lives. Prayer that is adequate for the complexity of lives, and that's exactly what you have in the book of Psalms. A list of prayers that really express all of life. If you're going to keep God before you, you're going to have to pray this way. When God gave the Israelite people his word, he also said this to them. In Deuteronomy chapter 6, I'm sure you already know it well, but God said, Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord alone. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. Keep these words that I am commanding you today in your heart. Recite them to your children and talk about them when you are at home and when you are away, when you lie down and when you rise. Bind them as a sign on your hand. Fix them as an emblem on your forehead. Write them on the doorpost of your house and on your gates. Whew. That's a whole lot of God's word, isn't it? But God knew. God knew that if we didn't keep his word before us, then we could never keep him before us Either. So if you're going to keep God before you, you're going to have to spend time in this little book right here. Well, pastor, how then should we do it? Well, there's a lot of ways to read God's words, a lot of practices, but you know what one of the best ways might be? You guessed it. Have you tried praying the Psalms? Sunday will come to an end. The reminder will fade as soon as you step back into the maze. And once you leave these doors, you go right back into that maze. You will forget the first commandment. Unless, unless you do some things during the week to help you remember. And of all those things that you could do, prayer and God's word, well, that's just the most foundational. I can't think of a better way to end it today than by quoting a prayer that was written by St. Patrick, which embodies, which embodies the mindset that I think it's going to take to keep God before us. And I want to pray it before we move into our time of invitation. And, and this is our time of invitation. We're inviting you to do some things if you haven't done them already. We're inviting you to join our church. We would love it if you would come this morning and join our fellowship. We would be excited for you, and we would be happy for you. And I promise you, you would see your spiritual life really explode if you committed yourself to a church. So you could do this this morning by just walking down this aisle and talking with me about it. And I'd like to meet with you again, and this church would just be so thrilled that you did. Or here's another thing that we're inviting you to do. Maybe you, you haven't kept God before you because you've never made a commitment to Jesus Christ before. How can you keep God before you if you've never given your life to Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior? So you could change that this morning and you could start that personal relationship with Jesus Christ that I talked about during the sermon that's so important for the Christian life. So those are the two things you could do this morning and you just walk down this aisle and I'd be thrilled to have you. But here's another thing that you're invited to do. 
you're invited to come down if you just need to pray with your pastor. Your pastor would love to pray with you, and if you are in need of prayer with him, with me, I'd love to do that with you. So pray with me this morning, and together we're praying the prayer of St. Patrick. Christ with me. Christ before me. Christ behind me. Christ in me. Christ beneath me. Christ above me. Christ on my right. Christ on my left. Christ when I lie down. Christ when I sit down. Christ in the heart of every man who thinks of me. Christ in the mouth of every man who speaks of me. Christ in the eye that sees me. Christ in the ear that hears me. I arise today through a mighty strength. The invocation of the Trinity through a belief in the threeness through a confession of the oneness of the creator of all creation. In your name that we pray, amen.